All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome, good to see you. So today we're going to uh, uh, look at a, 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 an idea called exceptional control flow that's a very important part of uh, uh, making modern systems. Um, and it exists at all levels of the system, from the lowest level hardware all the way up to um, software. So the idea is when, when you turn on a computer, from the, very f from the very first time you turn it on, it just does, executes one instruction after another until that you turn it off. Okay? And if each core, if you have multiple cores, then each of those cores are executing instructions one after the other. Now the, the sequence of instructions is called the control flow. Okay, and the, the, the actual sequence of instructions that the hardware is executing is called the physical control flow. Now normally, um, normally this control flow that uh, executes just one instruction after another just sequentially in memory. And we've, so far we've seen two, two mechanisms for altering the control flow so that it's, it's not, so that we're not executing just the next instruction. So that's branches and jumps and um, procedure call and return, okay. Now, now jumps and call, branches, jumps, call and return, um, those are reacting to changes in program state. So when you do a branch, you check the control uh, condition codes and then based on some, the results of that comparison, then you, then you do the branch, okay. Um, but a, a, a real system needs to be able to adapt to changes in the system state. Okay. So, for example, data arrives from a disk at, uh, or, or, some, or a network. Um, user types control C. Okay. The program executes an illegal instruction. Okay, all of these represent some, a change, some kind of change in the, in the system state and we need some way uh, to react to that. So this, the, so what we need is we call this exceptional control flow because it's sort of outside of the normal control flow that we, we see in, in our programs. Now exceptional control flow, or ECF, um, exists at all levels in the system from the very lowest level uh, hardware. Um, uh, at the very lowest level we have uh, what are called exceptions and these are changes in the control flow in, in response to, to some low-level uh, system event. So this is, uh, uh, or, and by event we mean a change in the state. Now exceptions are implemented using a combination of hardware and OS software, which we'll see in a, in a minute. But these, these exceptional control flow exists at higher levels too. Um, so in the a process context switch is an example of exceptional control flow that's also, it's implemented by uh, hardware and the operating system kernel. And a, so a process context switch, as we'll see later, later today, um, you're, executing, you're executing your code in, the curr in your current process and then all of a sudden this, the, the system is executing code from another process. Right? And so your process gets like suspended. And so there's a, um, so that's a form of exceptional control flow where you're, you're executing pro, uh, statements, uh, instructions within one, one process and then all of a sudden you're executing statements, uh, instructions in another process. Um, at a higher level, uh, totally in software, um, we, we have the idea of a signal. And the, this is implemented by operating system software. And we'll learn all about signals uh, uh, next lecture. And then even higher, uh, at an even higher level, you have non-local jumps in C, which are just implemented by the C runtime library. So this allows you, uh, non-local jumps allow you to break the normal call and return pattern. So from one, from within a function, normally you can only return to the, the function that calls, that called you. Uh, non-local jumps allow you to, within a function, uh, break that and return to some other, uh, some other function or some other part of the code. So we'll look at signals and non-local jumps uh, next lecture. Today we're going to look at exceptions and processes. 
So an exception is a, a transfer of uh, control to the operating system's kernel, um, where the, the kernel is the memory resident part uh, of the operating system. You know, so an operating system provides all kinds of programs like uh, to list files, to change directories, to list the current processes. Um, so all of that stuff constitutes the operating system. The kernel is the, the part of the operating system that's always uh, resident in memory. So a, an exception is, is this really low-level uh, transfer of control to the operating system because something happened in the system. So you're executing your code, user code, and then something happens, some event. So by event, we mean there's some change in the system state. In response to that, there, the exception transfers control from, from your user code to uh, code in the kernel, which is called an exception handler. And then the kernel responds to that change in some way. Um, this is called the exception processing. And then there's three, there's three things that can happen after the kernel um, handles the exception. It can return and re-execute the, the current instruction. Okay, and we'll see, this is, this is useful for things like page faults. It uh, allows us to implement virtual memory. Um, it could return to the next instruction, uh, which I've shown here, uh, or it could abort. Now, exceptions are implemented by hardware and software. So the, the actual transfer of control, um, you know, the change in the program counter, or IP, is, is, is done by the hardware. But the code that executes um, as a result of that uh, exception is set up and determined by the operating system kernel. So every, every type of event has a unique exception number which serves as an index into a jump table called an exception table. Okay. And so when, um, when event K happens, then the hardware looks, uses K as, a, as an index into this table and gets the address of the exception handler for that, for that, ex for that exception. Okay. And so every time that event uh, K happens, uh, that handler, handler K is, is invoked. Now, there's uh, different kinds of exceptions. We, we distinguish them as being asynchronous or, or synchronous. Uh, asynchronous exceptions uh, happen as a result of changes in, a, in state that are occurred outside, the, outside of the processor. So um, these are called interrupts. And those changes in state are, are the processor is notified about those changes in state by setting a pin on the, on the processor, an external pin called the uh, uh, interrupt pin. So this is the kind of um, when, say, a disk controller uh, finishes doing a direct memory access and copying data from the disk into memory, it notifies the processor that it's finished that uh, copy by setting the interrupt pin high. Okay. And so after an interrupt happens, um, the handler returns to the next instruction. So an interrupt typically um, it's as though you're, you're, you're running your program, you're running your program, and then there's like this little um, there's like this little pause while the interrupt handler runs and then your program just continues to run. Okay, so it's, it's usually sort of done behind the scenes and uh, doesn't, doesn't affect uh, your execution of your program. Now the most common uh, or a uh, a common example of an interrupt is a timer interrupt. So you're, all systems have a, a built-in timer that goes off every few milliseconds. And when, it, when the timer goes off, it sets the interrupt pin high. And there's a special exception number for, for timer interrupts. And this is, we need this uh, in order for the, this allows, we, we need this to allow the kernel to get uh, control of the system again. Otherwise, a user program could just run forever in an infinite loop, and no one, the, there'd be no way for the operating system to get, uh, to get control. So every few milliseconds, this timer goes off. That causes a, um, 
trans an exception into the, into the kernel, and then the kernel can, um, as we see, the kernel can decide what to do. Maybe, maybe schedule a new process or let the current process run. Uh, and then, and then this, an I.O. interrupt from an external device is, uh, is also a common example. Now, the other class of exceptions are synchronous exceptions, and there are three classes of those. Um, one, is a, one class is called a trap. A trap is an um, intentional exception. So this is an exception that's caused intentionally by the program. And the most, the most common form of a trap is a system call. So, you know, the operating system kernel provides all kinds of services to, to a program, but your program doesn't have direct access. Your program can't call functions in the kernel. It can't access data directly in the kernel uh, because that memory is protected and, and unavailable to user programs. So what the kernel does is it provides a, an, an inter, interface that allows programs to, 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 to make requests to effectively uh, call functions within the kernel and to make requests for various services. And this, this interface is called a system call. Okay, so a program makes a system call and, and, and requests various functions from the kernel. The kernel provides those sort of reacts to that request and then returns control back to the, the function, the, the calling program. So you can think of a system call as kind of, it, it's a, it, 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 it looks like a function call, but it's really transferring control into the kernel. Okay, then there's, um, so traps are intentional. Faults are unintentional, but, but maybe recoverable. Okay, so things like page faults, um, which uh, when we, we'll learn more about these when we study virtual memory, but something like a page fault, uh, it's actually recoverable. It's just the, the kernel has to, it means that the, the data, the portion of the address space that your program referenced isn't actually in memory. It needs to be copied from disk where it's stored into memory, and then the, the instruction that, that, that caused the fault needs, is just restarted, and then it works. The, 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 the memory is, is there, and then the instruction uh, works properly. Um, but other faults are, are uh, unintentional, unrecoverable, like protection faults. So if, if you try to access a portion of memory that's, um, that's not allocated, or um, floating point exceptions, oftentimes those, those, those can be recoverable. Um, so e in either case, when, when there's a fault, it either re-executes the current instruction or it, abo or it aborts. Um, and then there's unintentional and unrecoverable uh, exceptions, which are called aborts, and those, those always abort. So if you execute an illegal instruction, if there's a problem with your memory, memory and it's, it's corrupted, um, or if there's some problem with the machine, um, those create aborts that, that always uh, uh, that are unrecoverable and, and never return back to the, to the program. Now, system calls, uh, there's many different kinds of system calls, and they all have their own unique number, um, which is assigned by, uh, by Linux. So in a, um, for example, uh, to read a file, there's a system call called read, which is number zero. Um, opening a file is system call number two and so on. And there's, a, uh, there's an instruction called syscall, which uh, uh, actually performs the, the system call. Now, you usually don't use the system call instru the syscall instruction directly in your program. The uh, Linux wraps those in system level functions, which actually call it for you. Um, but it, it it's interesting to see how it actually works. So suppose you want to open a file. You call the system level function called open uh, with a file name and some options, say read only, write only. And so in a, the syscall instruction takes uh, uh, the first, the syscall number is in RAX. And then other, other arguments are in RDI, RSI, uh, RDX, R10, R8, and R9. So you can see if we look in the, the open function, calls the underscore underscore open function, 
which actually invokes uh, the syscall. So if you look at that code, you see it moves the 2, which is the syscall number for read, into, into uh, EAX, and then it does the syscall. Um, and, and then the, uh, the syscall returns um, its status in RAX. If it's a negative number, then that means something, some error occurred. Okay, if it's a positive number, um, then that means something that no error occurred. So in this case, in, a, in a, the open, it's returning a, a file descriptor, a small integer called a file descriptor, which then you, you can use in subsequent uh, calls to, to read and write. And then you, you can see the code is checking for this negative return value, uh, to, and there's a whole series of these compares. Um, So let's look at uh, uh, an example of a fault. So here, suppose we have this program that uh, we're writing into a, a, a valid region of memory, but it's, it's not actually stored on, it, it's not actually in the memory. It's, it's, it needs to be loaded from disk into, into memory. So this is a um, so-called page fault. So this, this instruction, this move L, uh, because, this, because the memory at this address isn't isn't available, triggers a page fault. So that, that creates an exception, a transfer of control into the, the page fault handler in the kernel, which copies that page from disk to memory. And then it returns. And when it returns, it re-executes the move L instruction. So that's kind of cool. So now the memory is available, and now that the move L this move L instruction, when it's re-executed, uh, uh, completes. And then we continue. Now, another type of uh, fault is an invalid memory reference. So here we have a, we're accessing uh, an element of A, uh, which doesn't exist. And it's an illegal, it's an invalid reference. So in this case, the move L instruction, it looks like a, it looks like a page fault. Uh, but the kernel detects that it's an invalid address, that there isn't anything that can be loaded from disk. This is an invalid region of the, the virtual address space. Um, so it, it sends a signal to the, uh, to the process uh, and then never, never returns. It, so the, the signal it sends is, is the infamous uh, uh, segmentation, the signal that causes the inf infamous uh, uh, segmentation fault message to print out. And we'll see, next lecture, we'll see, uh, we'll see how these signals actually, actually work. Okay, so at the, we've seen uh, exceptions are, are very low-level uh, transfers of control uh, that are implemented by both hardware and the operating system software. Because of, um, at the higher level is uh, another form of exceptional control flow called um, and we see it in the, in the context of a uh, process context switch. So let's look at, uh, and let's look at what, uh, what a process is. So a process, the idea of a process is one of the most fundamental and important ideas in computer science. And the, the classical definition of, is that a process is an instance of a running program. Okay, it's different from a program a program exists, can exist in many different places, right? A program exists in your C, in a, as text in a C file. It can exist as the dot text section of a, of a binary. Um, it can exist as bytes that have been loaded into memory. A process is an instance of a program that's, that's running, that's in execution. And, uh, a process provides two v key abstractions. Okay. It's, the first abstraction is, is that it gives, it gives you the illusion that you have uh, exclusive access to the CPU and the, and the registers. Okay, so when you're, running, when you're running your program in a process, you never have to worry about any other, any other programs modifying your registers. And, and you can't even tell. Um, that there's even other processes running on the system, right? It looks, except for occasional delays, like an instruction that just takes a little longer to run, 
except for that, it looks like you have unique, uh, exclusive, exclusive use of the, of the processor uh, and, its, and its registers. The, the other abstraction that it provides is the illusion that you have your own address space. Okay, so you have, and this is provided by uh, a mechanism called virtual memory. So each, each running program has its own code, data, heap, stack, and, and you never see the, the code, and, and you never see the memory that's being used by other processes. Okay, so it looks, for all intents and purposes, a process gives you this illusion that you have access to the, exclusive access to all the, the memory and the, and the processor. Now, the, the system runs many of these processes simultaneously. Um, even, uh, even on a system with a single core, many of the, these multiple processes are, are actually running at the same time, uh, concurrently. And you can see this if you look at uh, this. Uh, here I ran top on, on my Mac. And you can see it's running 123, 123 total processes, five of which are actually uh, r running, um, and each one of these processes has its own uh, unique process ID. This is integer. Now the way, so it looks, it looks like you have unique access or exclusive access to the, uh, uh, to the system, um, but in reality on a, uh, suppose we have a single core, on a r you're actually sharing the system and the, the, operating, the operating system is is sort of managing that sharing. So what it does is it, um, we have a, a process that's running, um, and it has its own, it has its own uh, uh, address space, and and it, it has its its uh, and it has its own registers, and now at some point, um, either because because uh, at some point an exception occurs, either because of a timer interrupt. Um, or, a, or, a, or a fault of some kind, or a trap. At some point, the, the operating system gets control of the system, and, and in this case, let's say it decides that it wants to run another process. So it copies the, the registers, the current, the current register values, into memory and saves them. And then it, it schedules the next process for execution, and it loads the the registers that were saved uh, fr from the last time that process was, was running, it loads those into the CPU registers, and then it switches the address space uh, to the address space for, uh, uh, for this process. So this, this, the address space and the register values are, are the context, and so the context switch is, is what is the change in the, in the address space and, and the registers. So then at that point, the, that process is running. Um, now in reality, on modern systems with uh, multiple cores, um, the operating system will schedule uh, processes on those multiple cores. And then if there's, no, if there's not enough cores to handle the processes, then it'll do the context switching uh, just like we showed uh, before. Now each process represents a, a what we call a logical control flow. So if you were to, you know, there's a physical control flow, which if we just looked at all the PC values, um, we'd be executing uh, instructions from one process, and then all of a sudden we'd be executing from another process. But within a single process, there's a logical control flow, which are all the instructions for that process. Now, we say that two processes run concurrently, if their flows overlap in time, otherwise they're sequential. So let's look at, let's look at an example. We have three processes. Process A runs for a while, um, and then it's, it's interrupted by process B and process C, and then eventually it, it, it continues running and then it terminates. Process B um, interrupts process A, and then it runs for a while, and then it terminates. Uh, process uh, C, once when process B finishes, then process C gets to run for a while. Um, then process A runs for a while, and then process C terminates. Okay, so given, given this definition of uh, concurrency, um, which, 
which of these processes are running concurrently? What about A, or a and B? Yes? So, so A and B's flows, B, B's flow overlaps with A's flow, right? So B, um, <coughs> uh, B finishes, starts and finish uh, some portion, this portion of B's flow overlaps with A's flow, right? Because B's still running, hasn't finished. Okay, so, so A and B are concurrent. As, and similarly, C and A overlap, um, so they're concurrent. But B and C are not concurrent, right? B finishes before C starts. Okay. Now, this idea of concurrency, um, it doesn't, this, this definition of concurrency holds regardless of the number of cores. Right? If, even if you have one core, this, this example that I showed you was on one core, but even if you have multiple cores, as long as the flows overlap in time, um, they're concurrent. But we can think of these, no matter what, we can, we can think of these as running in parallel with each other, at least from the point of view of these individual processes. Now, this, uh, this notion of a context switch, um, is, it's, managed by, uh, it's managed by the kernel. Okay, and it's important to realize that the kernel's not like a separate process that's running. It always runs in the context of some existing process. And it's, 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 it's just code that's in the upper portion of the address space that gets executed as a result of an exception. So what, what happens, the way to think about this is that you have this process A that runs, and then an exception occurs which transfers control to the kernel. The kernel invokes its scheduler, which decides whether to let A continue to run or to, 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 to do a context switch and run a new process, another process. So in this example, the scheduler has decided to, uh, to run process B, so it executes code, and then sort of changes, sort of once it repoints the address space, um, then it's running in the context of process B, and it finishes loading uh, the registers for, for process B, the general purpose registers, and then transfers control to B, and B picks up where it left off, okay? And then at some point, another exception occurs, uh, and, and the kernel decides to transfer control back to process A, which picks up where it left off right here. So whatever instruction, it finishes executing, whatever instruc instruction it was executing at the time of the exception, executes the next instruction here. <laughs> now, Linux provides a number of uh, functions that you can, you can call from a user program to manipulate processes. And this, this, this process, this act of manipulating processes, we refer to as process control. Um, now, all of these functions, most, or I should say, most of these functions call, invoke system, uh, make system calls, uh, but they're, they're, they're wrapped in, in higher levels, what we call system level functions that, that are the things you actually call from your user program. Now, System level, you know, Linux system level functions uh, will typically return a minus one if there's an error. And then they'll set a global variable called error no uh, to indicate the reason. So there's a hard and fast rule when you're doing, uh, when you're invoking system level functions. You must check the return values from those functions. You should, and this, you never, you'll get into, you'll, you'll get into huge trouble if you, if you neglect to check the return values. Okay, so you should never make a system, a sy system level function call without checking the return value. Um, the, and the only exception, there's some functions uh, that return void, uh, such as uh, exit or free, uh, don't return anything. So the way, the typical way you would do this is, like the fork call, which we use to create processes, returns the process ID of the, 
of the, the process that it created, which is always positive. If there's an error, it returns minus one. So we check for the return value to be less than zero, and then we, 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 we deal with that error somehow. Okay. In this case, we're just printing a, a message and, and exiting. Now this gets, although it's essential to do this, it gets um, sort of for, from, from my point of view where I'm trying to present code to you, um, it gets really messy. It takes up a lot of space. Yes? Why are you returning here with the zero instead of one? Isn't this like an error? I'm checking that it's less than zero. Oh yeah, that probably, that should be, normally the convention is to return non-zero. So you're right, that, uh, it's, it's not a hard and fast rule, but that's, that's typically the convention. So yes, it should be exit one. So what we'll do to simplify this uh, in the code that we present to you and in the code that we present to you in the book, uh, we'll, we'll define error reporting functions. So Unix style errors where you, the function returns minus one and then sets error no. Um, uh, we'll, if we get that kind of, if we get that kind of error, we'll, um, we'll print the, we'll print a message and we'll report what that error was before we exit. And so then in the code, we can replace that, that, that body of that uh, if statement with just a, a, a single line. Okay, so that, that makes the code a little tighter. Uh, but we'll, we'll go even further than that and we'll define these wrappers, which were uh, uh, pioneered by a great technical writer named uh, W. Richard S uh, Stevens. And what we do here is we, we replace each function with a, an error, a wrapper, uh, that has the identical uh, interface as the function, the original function, and it has the first, uh, the first letter uppercase. And then what this wrapper does is it calls it calls the original function, checks for the errors, and then, and then if there's no error, returns what the original function would have returned. So the, the, the behavior of this wrapper is identical uh, to the wrapped function if there's not an error. Okay, and if there is an error, then it, 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 it deals with it somehow and, and prints a message. And so then this allows us to uh, make our code really compact without violating this hard and fast rule that we have to, we have to check for errors. Okay, the simplest function, uh, process control functions are functions that allow you to get the PID for the current process, which is get PID, or the, the processor ID of your, the parent process that created the current process. Okay, so this, these take no arguments and they return a, a, an integer, which is a process ID. Now, um, Linux provides ways to create and terminate processes. And <clears throat> from a programmer's perspective, we can think of a process as being in one of three states. Um, running, so in this case, the, the process is actually running and execute instructions. Or it's, it, it, it can be scheduled. Maybe it's not running, but it, it can be scheduled at a later time. Right? So, um, and it's waiting, it's waiting to be scheduled. Um, it can be stopped, um, which means that execution is suspended uh, and won't be scheduled until further notice. So we'll see how this works when we study signals in the next lecture. But usually a process is stopped because it receives a, a, a certain kind of signal and then that, the process becomes stopped and it, it won't be executed. It won't be scheduled um, until you explicitly uh, tell it to be uh, scheduled. Uh, or a process can be terminated, which means it, it stopped permanently. Okay, so it'll never be scheduled again. It's done. Now, a, a process can be terminated for one of three reasons. So one, it receives a signal whose default action is to, to terminate it. Uh, or your, your program returns from the main routine. So, you know, you can, if you know the definition for main is int, C main routines always return an int. So you can return from main and that will terminate your, um, event, it will terminate the process or you can explicitly call the exit function. Um, the exit function um, exits the program with an exit status of, the, of its argument. 
So as, um, so as you pointed out, the, the convention is the, for normal return is to return zero and then non-zero on error. Um, or you can, another way to do this is just return, return an integer value from the main routine and that will, that will set the exit status. Now exit is, is kind of unusual and, and you, you'll see this is typical of, of, of all these process control functions that they normally functions you call them once and then they return once. Okay, but exit, you call once, and then it never returns. Okay, so that's, so that's a little unusual. Now, a parent process can create a child process by calling the fork function. So fork takes no arguments, and it returns an integer. It, it, it creates a, a new child process. And then it returns in both the parent and the child. So this is a little hard to wrap your head around at first. It's called once by the parent, but it, then it returns in both, it creates a new process, and then it returns in both the parent and the child. And to the child, it returns zero. To the parent, it, retur it returns the child's process ID. The child gets an identical copy of the parent's uh, virtual address space, but separate, right? They're, they're distinct, but immediately after the fork returns, the, the, addresses, the address space is identical. So that means that all the variables, all the global variables, the stack, the code, everything is identical in the child. It, it has the exact same values as it, as it does in the parent. The, the child gets identical copies of the parent's open, open file descriptor, so the child um, has access to any open files, including like standard in and standard out that the parent had. Um, and the, the only difference is that the child gets a different process ID than the parent. So fork is really strange uh, because it's called once, but returns twice, once in the parent and once in the child. So here's an example of this. Here's a, this is an example program that has a, it has a uh, local variable called x on the stack, initialized to one. And then it calls fork, and fork creates the child and returns, the, uh, uh, it, it returns a value to the, both the parent and the child. We, the only way we can distinguish whether we're executing in the parent or the child is to check that return value. Okay, so here if, if the process ID, if PID is zero, then we're executing in the child. And remember the child got exactly the same, uh, has exactly the same uh, uh, memory and, and code as the parent. So X in the child is, is one, so when we print we print this message from the child, we increment x, <clears throat> and then print this, this message. So the child will print uh, 1 plus 1, 2, uh, and then exit. In the parent, when we check the, this process ID, it's going to be non-zero because it's the process ID of the, of the child. So in this case, so, so the parent won't execute this, the body of this conditional. So the parent will, will execute this printf, and in the parent, we decrement x before we print it, so the parent prints out uh, 1 minus 1 is 0. Now, there's no guarantee. We have no guarantee whether the child or the parent execute first. It could, at when the fork, when the fork returns, the, the kernel may decide to schedule the child first, okay, in, which, in which case this code in the body of the conditional would run. Or it may, it may decide to run the parent first. Okay. And, and there's no way to predict, and you, it's, it's wrong, it's an error to make any assumption like that about what's going to run first, the parent or the child. And you can see that they share the same open files because uh, both the parent and the child print uh, to standard out, and, and it prints on the terminal. Okay. Yes? What if you call fork multiple times? 
What if, the question is, what if you call fork multiple times? I'll show you some examples of those. It gets a little hairy. We'll, have a, we'll, we'll, we'll use a model called a process graph to sort of, sort of uh, understand what happens. Okay, so like, just like you said, forks, forks are kind of, uh, can be kind of uh, complex and to understand, especially if they're nested or, or you call them multiple times. Um, so we use a tool called a process graph to, um, to capture sort of what, what could happen uh, when we call forks, right? We, can, we, can't, we can't make any assumption about the ordering of, of different processes, um, but we can capture the partial ordering of events using this, this tool called a, a process graph. So what we'll do is we'll let each vertex correspond to the execution of a statement, and then an edge is the happens before relation, so A happens before B. And then we'll label edges with current values of variables. If we have a printf vertices, a printf, a vertex that corresponds to a printf, we can label that with the output. And, and, and then the, every graph starts with a vertex with no in, in edges. So given this graph, then, any topological sort of the graph represents some feasible, uh, some feasible uh, total ordering of, of events. And by topological sort, we mean a total ordering of the vertices where all the edges uh, go from left to right. OK, so let's look at how this would work for our example program. Uh, here we have the parent. Uh, initially, x is equal to 1. And then the parent calls fork. The fork returns in both the parent and the child. Uh, the child prints. And both the parent and the child print uh, the value of x after incrementing or decrementing. And then they both exit. OK, so you can think of these as, uh, as happening. Uh, so these happen concurrently, right, which means they can be interleaved in, in, in any way. So the, the topological sort of this graph will tell us um, a feasible, what's a feasible, what are feasible interleavings. OK, so we can, so if we, if we relabel the graph, just to keep it simple, so if we, if we relabel these edges uh, with just single letters, then this total ordering, A, B, E, C, F, D, represent, is, represents, uh, it's a topological sort and thus a, a feasible total ordering. So here we have A executing, then B, then E executes in the child, and then at this point, the, the kernel decides to uh, swap, out, uh, swap out E, uh, swap out the, the child, and now let the parent run. So the parent p picks up and executes C. And then, and then it gets rescheduled. The then the child gets scheduled and executes F. And then the parent, the parent runs and finally finishes. Right? So this is, this is very unlikely that it you'd only execute one instruction and then, and then, be, uh, and then have a context switch. But it's, it's feasible, right? Because it, it represents, because the, the total ordering is a, is a, is a topological ordering. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this, is, this is infeasible because f, um, here in this total ordering, we're executing f before e. And you can see that this, that just can't happen. Right, so the, the edges on these, the logical flow represented by this child have to occur in this order, first E and then F, right, by the, just because F follows E in the code, right, the, the compiler's not going to, um, it's not going to alter those. Okay, so what happens if now if we have two consecutive forks? Well, let's draw the, the, the process graph will help us understand this. So in the parent, we print L0 and then fork. And that creates a child. And, both, and so the fork returns to this printf in both the parent and the child. So they, both the parent and the child print uh, L1. And then both parent and child execute a fork. So that creates that creates another child. That creates two more, now two, 
two children. Okay. And then, and so that returns to the printf, um, which says by. So the result of this, of calling fork twice like this, is that it creates four processes. Okay. And you can, and if it's confusing, you can always work it out with the, the process graph like this. Okay. So we can, we, can, uh, we can see feasible and infeasible orderings. So this one's feasible, take my word for it. This one is infeasible, and let's see why. So at L0, and there's no way to, to print by uh, before the first fork, right? So that's infeasible. If we, if we drew out this process graph, we'd have a backward, uh, a backward edge. Okay, now, what happens if we nest forks in the parent? Okay, I'm not sure why you'd want to do this, except maybe to torture 213 students. But, so we can just work this out by drawing the process graph. So here we have the parent, it prints L0, and then it does a fork, so that creates a, a child. So the child, um, if fork is not equal to zero, then we're in the parent, right? So this code executes in the parent. If fork is zero, then we're executing the child, and the child just prints by and then, um, and then terminate. It, it eventually terminates. I, I didn't show it here, but it calls exit. The, 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 the function that called this function calls exit. So the parent, so fork not equal to zero uh, indicates that this is the parent. So the parent prints L1, and then it does another fork. That fork creates a child. Um, so if, if, if fork is not equal to zero, then we're in the parent. So the par parent prints L2, and then exits this conditional and prints by. If, if uh, fork returns zero, then that means we're executing the child, so we don't execute this code, we, we jump out of this conditional, and then the child just prints by. Okay? And we can, uh, so this, this represents an infeasible output from this program. Um, L0 for, we, so L0 followed by by, that's feasible. And then followed by L1, that's okay. And then the next by is okay, but it's imp it's we can't have this we can't have this by uh, preceding this L two right? because L two will uh, this printf will execute before this printf. Okay, and I'll uh, I'll let you work out uh, this one uh, as a as an exercise. All right, now when a when a process terminates. Uh, for whatever reason, the system actually keeps it around for until it's reaped. And the reason, until it's reaped by its parent. And the reason it does this is that the parent may want to know about the exit status of the child. So if a, if a parent creates a child, it may want to wait for that child to finish and, and check its exit status. So when, when any process terminates, the system leaves it it doesn't, it doesn't remove it entirely from the system. It, it keeps it a, a, a little bit of state associated with that child in the form of a, the, net, the exit status of the child and, the, uh, and some other tables, some other OS tables. So because this child, it's terminated, but it's not gone, it, they're called zombies. So they're sort of half, half living, half dead. And so a, a process, a zombie, um, remains a zombie until it's, it's, it's reaped by its parent uh, using a function called wait or wait pit. And as a result of, as a result of doing wait or wait pit, the, the parent is given the exit status information, and then the kernel deletes the, the zombie process. Now what if the parent doesn't, re doesn't reap its, one of its child zombies? So if, if any parent, uh, if the parent terminates, then the system arranges 
for the very first process that existed in the system, called the init process, which has a process ID of one, it arranges for the init process to reap that, that child. So, there's, so orphaned, orphaned children uh, will always be reaped by, uh, by the init process. So we only really have to worry about, uh, about reaping zombies in, uh, in the case where we have long-running parents like shells uh, or servers. Right? Because in that case, uh, a server may create millions of child processes. Each one of those, each one of those, those uh, each one of those child processes, when they terminate, become zombies and they, they have state, which takes up room in the kernel. So you, you can get this, uh, it's, it's a form of memory leak. If you, don't, if you don't reap these zombie children, that can eventually fill up the memory space and crash the kernel. Right? So for, uh, for cases where you have long-running programs, then we have to, we have to use weight or weight PID. Uh, to reap the children. So let's look at an example. Uh, first, let's, let's look at an example of, 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 um, of this zombie phenomenon. So here we have a, a function we call fork, and then within the child, um, we print a message, uh, the process ID of that child, and then we exit the child. Within the parent, we print a message, and then we go into an infinite loop. Okay, so this is a parent that's that never, never reaps the child that it created. So if we run this program um, called forks, um, you can see it prints these two messages. The parent prints a message and the child prints a message. And then, <clears throat> um, and we're running it in the background with this ampersand, okay, because we're, we're going to, otherwise it would, it would, it's, it's, it's still running, and, and we wouldn't be able to uh, inspect it. So after we run this program in the background, then we use PS to print the current processes. And we can see that there's two. Uh, we can see here the parent, which is process ID 6639, and then the, the child, which is 6640. And the, um, the defunct indicates that it's a zombie. OK, now if we kill. Um, 6639, that's the parent, and then do another PS, you see that the zombie's gone, the, the child is gone because it's been reaped by the init process one. Okay. Now what happens if the child doesn't terminate? You might wonder, like, if, if a parent creates a child, uh, and then the parent, uh, uh, and then the, chi and the, the, the child never terminates, uh, and, the, and the parent terminates, then what would happen? Right? You might. So let's just let's look at an example of this and see. So here we're we're calling fork. We're creating a child. Within the child, uh, we print a message, and then we the child goes into an infinite loop. And the the parent prints a message and then exits. So if we run this program. Uh, you can see that the two messages from parent and child. And then if we look at the, if we look at the processes, we can, see, we can see that the child is still running. Okay, so the child process is still running, even though the parent is, has terminated. And now if we kill this child, 6676, And then if we kill it, then we can see that it's, it's gone and it's no longer in the system. Okay, so that child, when we, when we killed it, that terminated it, it had no parents, so the init process uh, reaped it and, it, it and it's no longer a zombie. So the, the, the function that we use to, uh, to synchronize with children and, and reap them, uh, the simplest one is called wait, and wait it takes an optional status uh, where you can get the exit status of the, uh, inspect the exit status of the, the child. Basically, wait suspends the execution of the process that calls it until one, uh, one of its children terminates. 
Okay, and it doesn't specify which one. It just waits until one of the children that it created terminates. And then if this child status is, is non-null, um, then the integer that it returns, or the integer that it points to, this is a pointer, the integer that it points to will be set to some value that indicated the reason the child terminated and its exit status. And you can, you can check that using these macros, um, which your, your textbook uh, describes in more detail. And I'll let you... Uh, so let's look at how, how this works in a simple example. So here we're, we're calling fork and creating a child which prints a message and then exits. The parent prints a message and then it waits for the child to terminate. And when the child terminates, uh, it prints a message and indicating that the child terminated and then prints by. So if we were to look at the, the process graph for this, you would see that we would have uh, the fork creates the parent and the child. Both the parent and the child do their, their printfs. And then the parent waits. It suspends until the, the child terminates, in this case by calling exit. OK, so what that means is it's, it's infeasible. Um, so you can say hello from the parent. It's infeasible, though, for this, this child terminated message, CT, uh, to occur before the by, right? because uh, because the, the child hasn't yet terminated. So it's, these, two, these two messages will never be printed until the child is terminated by calling exit. So is that clear? Yes. So the question is, can you have an output HP? HP, HC, CT by, yes. Yes, because the parent X prints HP. There's a context switch. The child prints HC and then exits. And now the parent will, the weight will return. And then it prints CT by. OK, here's, this is a, uh, an, this is a little more, uh, <clears throat> uh, little more involved example. So here what we want to do, we're going to create a bunch of children. And then we're going to wait for them all to terminate. And we're going to wait, but we, we won't be able to wait in any specific order. Right? We're just so here we have a loop, uh, 0 through n. And in each loop body, we're going we're to fork a child uh, and exit with a return status that, that's going to tell us which child it was. Okay, it's in the parent, so we do this. We do this a uh, n times, and then, and then afterward, the parent inside inside a similar loop uh, zero to n uh, waits for a child to terminate. So it'll it'll wa it'll wait for n children to terminate. Uh, wait returns a uh, wait returns the uh, the process ID, and then a status. Uh, which is uh, in, uh, in this uh, child status variable. And so we take that variable now, and we can use this w if exited macro to determine if it terminated normally with an exit by calling exit. And if so, then we can check its exit status using the w exit status macro. Uh, otherwise, if, it, if, if w if exited uh, is false, then that means some, something the child terminated for some other reason, not, not because it called exit. OK, there's a, uh, we, can, we can actually use wait PID, which is similar to wait, but it allows us to wait for a specific process, a specific child, a specific, a specific child with a specific process ID to terminate. And I'll, I'll let you uh, 
you, you can, weight pit is, is really involved and um, uh, it's described in detail in, the, in your textbook and, and so you'll need to look, you'll need to look there for the details on, of how that works. Now another important, so we've learned how to create new processes. Um, the, but we haven't learned how to, when we, when we call fork, we just create an exact copy of the, the child is just an exact copy of, of the parent running the same code, same program, same variables. Okay, to run a different program inside of a process, we use a function called exec, V-E. And exec loads and runs within the current process, it loads and runs the executable file name, which is its first argument. And file name can be either a binary, executable binary, okay, or it can be a script, it can be a text file, um, a so-called script file that starts, whose first line starts with a, a uh, pound, bang, and, the, and then the, the path of some interpreter. So for example, if you, if you want to write a shell script, you, the first line of your shell script is, is uh, pound, bang, and then the, uh, the path name of the bash shell. And then that'll, that will execute bash, and then bash will, will read in the, the, the lines following and interpret them as, just as though you'd type them in at the, at the command line. So in either case, uh, it executes either an interpreter or it executes a binary with Who's argue, with the argument list argv and a list of environment variables in envp. Okay, now by default, arg, the first argument uh, in argv is the name of the file that, that's being executed. So it's, it's, it's this file name. So what that allows you to do is in your code, you can check argv0. If you want to print out the name of the file, the name of the program that's executing, you, you just print out argv0. Okay. okay, now an exec overwrites all of the code and the data and the stack. It overwrites the, completely overwrites the virtual address space. So if, once you call exec within a, within a process, you, it blows away the current program. That's it. However, it retains that it, it's still the same process. It's just running now a different program. And so it retains the process ID and any open files uh, that you have. So exec is really, is really mind-blowing because it's called once, but it never returns. Uh, except if there's an error. So if, if, if this file doesn't exist, for example, then, then exec will return uh, minus one. But otherwise, in normal operation, it never returns. All right, so let's look at the structure of the stack when this new program starts. So after, 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 ex, after the exec VE finishes its work, it creates a new stack. It loads in uh, new code and data creates a new empty heap. Okay, everything's new. And the stack that it creates has the following form. Okay, at the bottom, here's the bottom of the stack and our stack is growing uh, this way. So the first function that executes is, is a function called libc underscore start underscore main. So that has a, that has a stack frame. So let's look, this is what I'm showing here is the situation right before the startup code calls main. Okay. So there's, there's the future stack frame for main will be here at the top of this, following the top of the stack. There's some padding and then the argument list in argv is contained on the, on the stack. So the, the argv is a list of pointers terminated by the null pointer, and each one of these pointers points up into a string that corresponds to an argument. Okay, so when you run a program, um, you, you specify the program name, 
and then arguments separated by spaces. Okay. And so these, these arguments, this argv is a, is a list of pointers to those argument strings. And it's pointed to, right, right as main is called, it's, 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 it's the second argument to main, so it's contained in uh, RSI, the address of, of, of this argument list. Um, the number of arguments is contained, is the first argument, argc, and that's contained in RDI by the x86-64 uh, parameter passing convention. Now the environment list is also contained on the stack, and it too consists of a list of pointers, uh, each of which points into an environment string, which is a set of key equal value pairs. Okay. And it's pointed to by the global environment variable, environ, and if it's passed in, um, it's pointed at uh, in EMVP, which is contained in RDX, which is the, always holds the third argument. Okay, so let's look now how, how we would use this. So we want to, within our current program, we want to execute the ls command with two arguments, dash lt and slash user slash include. So what this is saying is list, list the files in slash user include, um, show the long form of the listing, and sort them in time order from most recently used to least recently used. So, so the way we do this, if we just called exec VE, it'd blow away our program. So assuming we want to continue to do work after we execute ls, the, the standard way to do this is to, to create a child using fork and then exec within the child, right? Have the child do the work and then the child terminates and the, the uh, parent maybe will wait for the child, maybe not, right? Just usually it will wait for the child. So within the parent, we, we, we fork a child, check that it's zero, and so if it's zero, then we're executing, the, this code executes within the child. So the child does the exec. It, it passes the name of the function, since the, the name of the function that we want to, the, the program that we want to execute is always contained in the first element of, of argv, we call exec with a parameter of my argv zero. And we, we've set up the argument list in my argv, and we pass the global environment variable uh, environ. Uh, we're just going to use the current list of environment variables uh, that we have in the parent. Okay, and these environment variables are things of the form user equal dro, current working directory. Um, and so the, the uh, if, there's, if, if this program in myargv0 doesn't exist, then exec will re return minus one. So we, we check for that, that condition uh, and then exit. Uh, otherwise, it never returns, right? It executes ls. ls, the code for ls, this is the name of a binary. This is slash bin slash ls is a binary file. That binary file gets loaded into memory. Uh, that code gets executed and it terminates. Okay, so the child, at this point, after the exec, uh, the child is running the, the ls code and it's no longer running uh, any of this code. Now this seems, um, the first time you see this, this combination of fork and exec, it seems, it seems a little odd, doesn't it? Um, why not just why not just have one command that creates a new process and runs, and runs a program in that process? Why, why separate? Why have these, these two separate uh, fork and exec? I mean, in fact, Windows does this. Windows has like one command that creates a process and executes it. But it turns out that having, uh, having a separate uh, function like fork just to create processes is, is, is actually really useful. 
I mean, sometimes you just want to create replicas of your current process. For example, let's say you have a server and you want to create a, a concurrent server. You want to create multiple copies of that server, then you just fork a bunch. You have the main, the parent server can fork a bunch of, of children. So that's useful, and they're just all running the same code. Um, but what's all, what this also allows you to do is that it allows you to execute code in the child uh, before you call exec. So you may want to set some, um, you may want to set some, uh, like some signal. This is especially useful when you're dealing with, uh, with things like signals, if you want to block certain signals or unblock certain signals. You can do it right here in this, this gap between the fork and the exec. Okay, so, uh, so that's it. So just to summarize what we've, uh, we've talked about today, um, exceptions are uh, in response to events that require some kind of non-standard or exceptional, uh, what we call exceptional control flow. Um, they can be generated internally in the form of interrupts or internally in the form of traps and faults. So it, it, at any point in time, a process has multiple, a system has multiple processes only one of which can execute on a single core. So the, the process execution is interleaved by the kernel. And each process thinks that it has sort of total, uh, total control of the processor and its address space. Um, there's only one mechanism to spawn processes, that's fork. And it's called once and returns twice. Uh, we, we can terminate our process by calling ex exit, which is called once and never returns. Um, we reap and wait for processes using wait or wait PID, and we load and run programs using execve or one of its, uh, one of its variants. And this one is called once and, and normally never returns. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it for today, and uh, we'll see you. Have a good weekend, and we'll see you on Tuesday.